Um, so my name is Haley Hatfield. I'm the lead intern for the Media Makers for the Center of Excellence for Women and Technology. And joining me for hosting this is two other interns, Jalisa and Alexia. And, Hello. <laughs> and so um, they'll be kind of monitoring, monitoring the chat for me as I go through this um, slideshow and exercise for this workshop. And has anyone been to a Media Makers uh, workshop before, whether it was live or in person? Yes, okay, cool. First time, awesome. Um, so just a little um, description of what Media Makers um, and what we do as a team is we like to focus a lot on the Adobe Creative Suite and go over some like technical tutorials and mostly focused on design and other kind of media forms. Um, and so today we'll actually be working with Adobe Illustrator for a little bit. Um, and usually we do, if you have been to our previous events, we do focus more on just straight to technical. Um, but for this uh, workshop today, we thought it would be good to kind of maybe take a step back a little bit and break down the fundamentals of graphic design and what makes good design. And if at any point, if I'm going too fast or something, or you have a question, go ahead and pop that in the chat and either myself, Jalisa or Alexia will answer that. So I'm going to go ahead and get started. And also, um, just to know, I am recording all of this. So if you do have to leave early, um, we will be posting this later to the CWIT YouTube page. All right, so, uh, and can everyone see my slideshow okay? Yes, okay. So today's goals, I'm gonna cover the elements of design, principles of design, and how to use these to create good design. And then we have an Illustrator design thinking exercise at the end. And so if you don't already have um, Adobe Illustrator downloaded, please go ahead and do that um, before we get to that step. Um, and you can do that through IU Where, IU Anywhere. And um, so what we'll be doing today is something that I have done with my students. I've previously taught Graphic Design 1 and Graphic Design 2 in the media school. And so I've tried to break down what I typically spend about two to three weeks teaching into this two hour workshop. So hopefully it'll be okay, um, but I try to make it interesting and hopefully we'll, at the end of this, everyone will learn something new. So. Um, what is graphic design? So let me move my chat window, sorry. Graphic design is the art of visual communication that combines images, words, and ideas to convey information to an audience, especially to produce a specific effect. In other words, graphic design is communication design. It's a way of conveying ideas through visuals and design. All right, and so, so what are the elements of design? And so um, essentially when you think of elements, they are what makes up the parts of a design, which would, does anyone want to take a stab at maybe what an element might be, if you're familiar at all with it, or just want to guess? Color. I'm sorry? Color. Color, yes, color is one. Shape. What was another one, sorry? Shape. Shape, yes. All right, cool. So yeah, um, let me. So the first one is a point, and that's um, I'll kind of describe these later as we go. And then line, and then someone did mention shape, and then form, space, color, is a huge one. Um, typography. Some people don't always include this as an element, um, and I'll explain why but I like to include it just um, because it is such a broad subject um, and also texture. Okay, so point, a point is basically the beginning of something and nothing. Um, it forces the mind to think upon its position and gives something to build upon in both imagination and space, which I know seems kind of abstract a little bit, um, but essentially it's just the, everything starts with a point. It can't exist without starting somewhere. Um, so even if there's only one point, one mark on a blank page, there's something built into the brain that wills meaning for it and seeks relationship or order, if only to use it as a point of orientation in relation to the outline of the page. So we all recognize this dot as a point. And so if there are two points, immediately the eye will make 
a connection and see a line. So even though there isn't really a connection here, we still view this as two points that are still connected. And then if there are three points, it is unavoidable to interpret them as a triangle. The mind supplies the connections. And so this idea of how the brain visualizes these um, points and elements really um, attribute to what kind of message you're communicating to your audience. Okay, and then, and if anyone is familiar with like psychology at all, there is a whole section um, called Gestalt, um, which is like design psychology theory um, that talks about these different ways that the mind um, connects these different elements together to convey meaning. Okay, and then a line. So a line is a mark made by a moving point and having psychological impact according to its direction, weight, and the variations in its direction and weight. It is an enormously useful and versatile graphic de device that is made to function in both visual and verbal ways. It can act as a symbolic language or it can communicate emotion through its character and direction. So again, we have this point that's the beginning of something. And then a line is just an extended point. Okay. And so again, line can be tons of different variations. You can take um, have a lot to say with just a single line. Um, you can create texture with line, whether it's lines that are closer together, they're overlapping, they're curved, um, and can create depth. So it's a very versatile element to use. And then shape. So a shape is essentially um, an enclose, enclosed space defined by a line or by contrast to its surroundings. Shapes are two-dimensional, so they're flat. So like a circle, square, triangle, organic blob, etc. And so again, we see that it's still, if you could think of it as it's still a point and it is a line that has then just been enclosed. So like we see with the circle and a rectangle. Um, and they can be geometric. So like we saw just a second ago, or they can also be organic. And then, oops, my photo is there first. Okay, so a form is an element that is three-dimensional and encloses volume. It includes height, width, and depth. So as a cube, sphere, a pyramid, or a cylinder. Um, it may also be free flowing. So again, it can still be organic and not always uh, geometrical. And you can see with this um, image that I've included here, it's made up with just a bunch of lines um, that are either just changed direction, changed um, the spacing between them to allow that shading and to form that depth that um, creates that three dimensional feeling. And then space. So this is the distance or area around or between elements of an artwork. It's the illusion of the illusion of depth created on a flat surface through the use of linear perspective, overlapping elements, size, level, de detail, color, and value. So art elements placed far apart can emphasize the extent of space between them. So something that looks like it's receding backwards or even coming forward. Um, so elements of work getting closer to each other they more distinctly define the space between them, emphasizing the shape or volume of the space, which can in turn create interest. So if you have two objects that are really close to each other, that starts creating, that's depending on that space between them, it can create tension, it can create um, all kinds of different feelings. And then so as the space between shapes or forms shrinks even more, visual tension builds between them as they near touching, which can be more interesting than if the shape forms uh, do make contact. So this um, often happens with, when I teach, I guess, um, design one with um, newer students with graphic design, oftentimes they feel confined to a composition box. And so this is kind of where space becomes more interesting when you start overlapping that edge of the page um, that way you're not just like sticking shapes right on the edge of a of your page 
because then it can kind of create this awkward tension that maybe you're not trying to go for with your, your work. Um, so here's an example of space. So this would be like negative and positive space. Um, you can see with the using birds to create that. And then color is a huge one. Um, if anyone has studied like color theory or anything, that's super interesting to me. Um, so an element of art made up of three properties. So hue, value, and saturation. Hue is essentially the name of the color. So like red, blue, green. Value is the hue's lightness and darkness. So a color's value changes uh, when white or black is added. And saturation is the quality of brightness. So a high intensity color is stronger and brighter and then low intensity color is faint and dull. So then here's that graphic kind of explaining what a hue and the value and saturation would look like. Okay. And then also with color value, there are tint, shades, and tones, which tint is adding white to a hue, shade is adding black to a hue, and then tone is adding gray to a hue. And so what's really nice with working like with something like Adobe Illustrator is a lot of these palettes are already kind of made for you. Um, and it makes that process a little bit easier. Because if anyone's ever painted before, it's a little bit harder to like do that yourself. <laughs> Um, there's also gradation, so you can work with different gradients um, and blend those different colors together. And again, working with digital tools makes this a breeze. Um, so then I did want to include typography. Um, so it can literally convey the message you want to communicate. Uh, but type can also be more than words. If used in an intentional way, type can also be a striking visual element or a shape, as well as provide structure between the content and the visuals. And so why sometimes people don't include typography, it's because essentially these letter forms are just shapes, right? They're an extended point that's a line that is then enclosed. So they, each letter form is essentially a shape, but typography is such a huge area of graphic design that I always just like to include it and point that out because you can convey, you can, it's since it's the letter form, the actual letter form can convey um, the actual message that you want to communicate. You can kind of play around a lot with like the lines of the different shapes and the different um, typeface that you choose. So I, I always like to include it as just its own element since it is such a broad topic. And then here's just some more examples of what you can kind of do with type um, to visually represent your message and adding like contrast and color. All right, and then this last element is texture. So this is the tactile sensation or feel of a surface. So rough, smooth, spiky, et cetera, or how something appears to feel. And so visual texture is probably what we're all mostly used to. So it's referred to as implied texture. It's not detectable by our sense of touch, but by our sense of sight. So visual texture is the illusion of a real texture on a two dimensional surface. And so here's like an example, kind of creating that rough effect with this like stippling um, effect with the graphic, um, putting the eclipses nearer or farther together to create depth and almost just kind of a rough feel to it. Um, here's just like an example of someone took a photo of actual texture and then used it, like repurposed it and used it as an ice cream cone um, to look like actual texture on a page or even just with lines. So, you know, again, with like lines spaced further apart makes it feel like it is coming closer to you where lines that are closer together, it looks like it's receding and then creating those different shading effects and lines creates almost like a fabric fold. All right, are there any questions so far? Pretty straightforward. Okay. All right. Awesome. So what are the principles of design? So these are principles applied to the elements of design that bring them together into one design. Um, so how one applies these principles determines how successful a design may be. So this is where you start seeing all those elements start working together um, and creating your composition and your message that you're trying to communicate. So those include balance, 
proximity, emphasis, focal point, contrast. Um, so the reason why I kind of included all of them is because sometimes they're referred to as different names depending on who you're talking to, I guess. So I like to kind of combine them all just so that it creates some sort of um, cohesive, like, yeah. <laughs> um, then movement, repetition, rhythm, pattern, scale, proportion, variety, variation, unity, harmony. All right, so balance. So balance is a distribution of the visual weight of objects, colors, texture, and space. If the design was a scale, these elements should be balanced to make a design feel stable. And so there are different kinds of balance, which um, symmetrical balance. So the elements used on one side of the design are similar to those on the other side. Asymmetrical balance, the sides are different, but still look balanced. And often this can be achieved with um, like negative space balancing out uh, the positive space. And then also radial balance. The elements are arranged around a central point and may be similar. So some examples. So this would be an example of symmetrical. Even though those they have two different colors, it is still completely symmetrical and balanced. If you were to like cut this in half or in quarters. Again here with this like movie poster. Again, if you were to cut that in half. Symmetrical. And then here would be an example of asymmetrical. So even though it, there are graphics happening down at the bottom, um, that negative space there at the top still allows that space to hold it. Again, asymmetrical with having that empty space down in the corner, it kind of allows that design to breathe a little bit. Um, this would be kind of asymmetrical radial. So again, coming around that central point, um, spacing out those dots to where it creates a feel of depth. Another example of radial, also symmetrical. Another example. I would say book covers are a good way, like way to start looking at how these design principles are used. Um, it is a big industry that people design for. Um, so the next one, proximity, helps in creating a re relationship between similar or related elements. These elements need not be grouped together. Instead, they should be visually connected by way of font, color, size, etc. And so this is one of the harder uh, principles to kind of teach, at least in my um, history, I guess, because even something like this, like it may not feel as if it's a cohesive design, but you still see that there are, um, let me go back. So the elements, they don't need to be grouped together. They should be visually connected by way of font, color, size, etc. So this is kind of the receding back in space, but you can see this wouldn't have the same feeling if they were using all different types of fonts as they were breaking apart these letter forms. Um, same with like the grouping. So with these squares up in the top left corner, you, you don't see these all as individual squares. You see this more as a group of squares versus the ones that start kind of breaking apart. You see those more as individual squares. Does that kind of makes sense. Like the way your brain processes, like when you group elements together, you see them as a whole versus when something is kind of fallen off or by itself, you see that as a separate part of the design. Okay. And again, just with that spacing and um, creating that illusion of depth, whether um, objects are spaced together or further, further apart or closer together. Okay, so then emphasis, focal point contrast. Um, emphasis is created by visually reinforcing something we want the viewer to pay attention to. 
And focal points are areas of interest the viewer's eye skips to. So again, thinking of like hierarchy within your design, like what, what do you want your viewer to look at first? That's always gonna be your focal point. And then you can use different techniques of, to emphasize that, that focal point. Um, so the strongest focal point with the greatest visual weight is the dominant element of the work. Um, so some of those techniques that could help with that is isolation, leading lines and convergence, contrast, anomaly, size, placement, framing, focus and depth of field, the, um, the absence of focal points are some of the strategy, strategies used to help create these degrees of importance. So lots of different ways to get your initial point across, to like pull your viewer in and then they can look at the rest of the composition. So something like this, the emphasis focal point would definitely be adding that um, splash of color. So immediately you're drawn to the color against the black and white lines. And so like this painting, um, so it's obvious that the emphasis there is that um, red eye there and it's because it's larger than the rest of it, it's a different color and it's also spaced in the center. And then even like something like this, so even though that's the exact same pattern is being used, they've scaled it down and even adjusted it over to the right, but you are still drawn to that circle because of the way that they've maneuvered the different elements. And then this book cover again, so that flower there in the center, having all of those flower petals pointing inward draws the viewer's eye straight into like the title of the book and the author. There's something like this with a magazine, having just a big splash of color that goes across so immediately your viewer is reading that think differently and then they follow right into the article. Okay, so then movement. So it's using art elements to direct a viewer's eye along a path through the artwork and or to show movement, action and direction. So in a still picture, such as a painting or photograph where nothing is actually moving, very, oops, sorry, various strategies can be used to give the viewer a sense of movement and speed or to move the viewer's eye through the work. So these include lines, diagonals, and unbalanced elements, blurring, placement, direction, and motion lines and after images. So something to always keep in mind is that we typically read from like left to right. And so that's always something when thinking about how you're designing and pulling in your audience to have them look about like the, the overall composition. Um, so then here, is that all that includes lines? Okay, so then here was just like a simple example of just using those lines and shapes um, of elements that we talked about before and space. And so by um, positioning them in a certain way, it creates this illusion of like a flipping page. It's not actually moving, but because of the way um, the element has been created, it creates that illusion. And same with this. So um, oftentimes you will see all principles working together also. So like here, this isn't just movement because it's the use of um, like repetition, which we'll cover next, um, pattern, spacing, to make it feel as if it's receding back in space because this is just a flat composition, but because these elements are larger up at the front and then smaller in the back, it gives that illusion that it's just moving back into space. Similar here. So it's larger up front to give that kind of foreground feeling and then it's going back into the space but as it goes smaller and shrinks down. And then something like this with this um, movement here, where it's this uh, kind of organic flow feeling that's going and spreading across the page. And then again, like in this, so we'll cover repetition, rhythm and pattern. And so a lot of that you'll see happening with movement is a lot of these same kind of principles working together. 
Um, so repetition works with pattern to make the work of art seem active. The repetition of elements of design creates unity within the work of art. Rhythm is created when one or more elements of a design are used repeatedly to create a feeling of organized movement. Rhythm creates a mood like music or dancing. To keep rhythm exciting and active, variety is essential. So if you just have like one dot just constantly repeating itself, like it kind of may not seem too fun or active or exciting. And so variety, which will be the next um, principle we cover, helps keep that rhythm and momentum happening. And then pattern is the repeating of an object or symbol all over the work of art. So here would be an example of this design. So lots of repetition, rhythm and pattern happening here. It's also balanced. Um, I feel like I forgot the rest of them. <laughs> and then, okay, so then here's another example of a poster. So lots of repetition, there's rhythm where it's um, the curved lines. It's a pattern because it's repeated elements. And then we see the focal point and the emphasis by just the slight color change here. And then, and here having that repetition of these shapes here and then by making them smaller, it gives that illusion of um, depth and space. And it doesn't necessarily have to be just like shapes in a line. So repetition can just be repeating repeat like sorry elements repeated on a page that help connect the viewer to know that this is one whole cohesive design and you can lead your viewer with these different elements all right so scale and proportion so proportion is a relationship of sizes between different parts of a work so for example how wide it is compared to how tall it is some proportions, such as the golden ratio and the rule of thirds, are thought to be more naturally pleasing. And then scale is the size of something compared to the world in general. So an artwork might be termed miniature, small scale, full scale, or life size, large scale, or larger than life, or monumental. So always just thinking of the objects on your page in relation to what they appear to in real life. Um, and Hopefully I'll explain that a little bit better with an example. Um, but then just to quickly cover proportion and composition. So this would be the rule of thirds. If you're familiar with um, photography at all, that's usually what gets taught um, right away. So wanting to create that interest um, in your composition, you don't want to overcrowd your viewer. And usually something that's at these crosshairs is what your viewer is going to look at first and it makes it like group the proportion of the object that you're showing in your picture is has a nice balance to it um so this also applies to like web design um and then posters this would be an example so even though this kind of looks chaotic um at first if you do break that into that rule of thirds composition and you think about each of these different um, thirds, they all seem relatively balanced with one another. And then if you're familiar with the golden ratio or the golden spiral, um, so this is like a 13 by eight rectangle that then breaks apart into a perfect square until it just spirals down um, and we did do a workshop previously where we covered the golden ratio. Um, and so, yeah, so this would be that golden ratio, which is argued that it's appealing because we see this sort of ratio in real life um, or in nature. This is why we like this um, sort of composition in the way we like to consume our information and our visuals. So here's an example, like this magazine cover. So you see the large photo and then you break down the information into smaller areas. On web pages also, you have the large um, image to draw your viewer in first and then they can kind of continue into the more fine 
tune details. And then here is an example of scale that I was trying to talk about how like in, so before, if you don't think about size in relation to real world, so this doesn't create, before doesn't create that much visual interest. Um, thinking about like the scuba diver with the whale and you kind of don't really know like what the depth is, how close they are to the whale. Um, so then with this after, just changing that, thinking about that perspective of real life um, size and proportion, this creates so much more visual interest with having the diver be a bit smaller with the whale there. Um, and just, it makes it a little bit more realistic and a nicer design in my opinion. Okay, so then variety and variation. So this is using a range of different qualities or instances of an art element to create a desired visual effect. So a variety of shapes, colors, etc. So all of those different elements that we've talked about. Um, variety can add interest and break the dullness of simple repetitions. Um, so this poster again, if all those different um, like dynamic lines were all the same color, it wouldn't be as interesting as now they've kind of used this um, change up the different color, added contrast, lots of variety of the direction of the lines, where they're coming out from the letters. Um, so something like this, they're all triangles, um, but adding those different colors and um, changing the direction of where they're facing creates much more interest to the uh, viewer. All right, and then unity and harmony. Um, some will argue that this is like the most important one. Um, so according to some, achieving visual unity is the main goal of graphic design. Um, the concept of unity describes the relationship between the individual parts and the whole of the composition. So everything is working together. And then it investigates the aspects of a given design that are necessary to tie the composition together to give it a sense of wholeness or to break it apart and give it a sense of variety. And then unity in design is a concept that stems from some of the gestalt theories of visual perception and psychology, specifically those dealing with how the human brain organizes visual information into categories or groups. So, oh, sorry, I borrowed this from my class lesson, ignore that. <laughs> um, but I do encourage you if you are interested in some of these visual perception and psychology um, theories, Gestalt is a good place to start. Um, it is, I think, I find it interesting. Um, so something with like unity and harmony. So as an exercise, I always like to go through those different principles just to see what I can find in the composition and decide if it feels like it's all um, unified. So if it's balanced, and if you look at it as a whole, it's, I would say it's asymmetrical balance. Um, but as far as having, you know, the, having the space over here helps balance all of the different colors and everything going on on the right side. Um, movement. So having curved lines help create that sense of movement a lot. Um, repeated elements. So we still see these kind of similar shapes. And then there's variety in there because there are different images and different colors that have been added into there. Um, what else was there? Emphasis. So I think definitely you draw around this yellow paint bucket there in the middle. Am I missing one? I should have a list. But yeah, so it's always like a good exercise to go through if you have you know, books or magazines around you, just kind of maybe go through those uh, principles and see what sort of um, ones you can identify. Um, let me continue. All right, so again here, um, so see movement, pattern, variety, um, it feels balanced, it's um, asymmetrical again. Um, what else is there? Harmony, movement, rhythm, pattern. I should have wrote down a list, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, let's move on. So again, with this, so looking at unity and harmony. So a lot of using that same yellow, this um, 
composition probably wouldn't look as strong or unified had they used like different shades of yellow or try to just completely changed and had this yellow in the title page, but then switched to a completely different color. It wouldn't feel like it was um, uh, a set. And, you know, seeing these, like keeping those kind of hand drawn elements around and you see these repeated elements with like the uh, black shapes that are emphasizing different areas. So yeah, hopefully it's at least describing how to look through designs and recognize these principles and how they are working together to create a more, more dynamic experience for the viewer. Okay, so then something like this ad, what sort of principles do you see working here to convey their message? Anyone wants to take a stab at it? Symmetry? Yes. Repetition? Yep. Focal point? Yeah, definitely. And because of um, like proximity and then grouped together like that, it, you know, it's obvious to your viewer that it's teeth and it's about to munch down. On that cheese it. Cool. What about something like this? Depth, yeah, so definitely using um, space, variety, mm -hmm. repetition. Yeah, so playing with like the size helps give that um, different feeling of space and depth to this. Radial asymmetry, scale, yeah. All right, what about something like this? Repetition, mm-hmm. Pattern. Definitely some movement with like little literal arrows. Yep, movement, yep. You, um, variety by changing up the color. It wouldn't be as interesting probably if it was just all the same color. Awesome. Okay, so color. I'm not gonna get too deep into color theory because it's such a huge concept, but I think it is um, interesting to kind of know some of the basics with it. And so are people familiar with the color wheel at all? I'm just gonna talk about it for like two seconds. Yes, okay, cool. Um, so color or hue is a vast component and can be used in many ways in design. CMYK is used for print while RGB is used for digital. Um, and then just pay attention to color trends and design around you. Um, I like to always have my students kind of look at the way apps first looked when we, like smartphones first became a thing to where they used to use color and gradients to make it look like it was a physical button that we would push um, on our phones. Whereas now it's very flat. We're, we're now more used to the way these devices work. And so we don't need all those extra um, kind of color and gradation and borders to ha help us to kind of understand that like we're moving from a physical button to a virtual one in a sense. Um, okay, so then does anyone know the primary colors? I hope no one's like typing. Um, oh, red. Close, yeah. Red, red, oops, red, blue, and yellow. Yeah, awesome. 
Okay, my animations are way out of sync. Okay, secondary. Green, orange, purple, violet. Right, yeah, so they will be, so green, orange, and purple or violet, depending who you're talking to, I guess. Um, so yeah, so primary are, is like this triangle, and then the secondary are kind of like the upside down opposite triangle of that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right, how about the tertiary? Tertiary, tertiary, tertiary. You need not to say all of them if you just say one or something. Green, yellow. Yeah, so those are all between primary and secondary. Yep. So those are like the yellow, green, yellow, orange, red, violet, all of those. Okay, what about complementary? Across the color rule? Yep, exactly right. Yeah, so then uh, violet, yellow, orange and blue, or I guess this orange and blue, green and red. Cool, okay, what about cool or warm colors? Yeah, okay, so what I like to, yeah, warm, yellow, orange, red. Yeah, so I kind of associate it with warm is the reds and oranges and yellows that kind of remind you of like fire, whereas cool is the purples, blues, um, greens that are more like water or something like that. Um, so kind of just this imaginary line somewhere across to divide that up and you have your like cool and warm side. Awesome. Um, so this is just, that's all I have about the color wheel, but um, I think color theory is super interesting. So if you want to learn more about that and how colors work together, how people perceive colors and the meaning behind colors, because, you know, if you think about something like red, that could be associated with like danger or it could be associated with love and passion. And so it really just depends on the message that you're going for and what you're conveying to your audience. Um, Okay, so then another great thing is looking at movie posters. Um, I think it's especially with like color because you can see the different um, how they're using color to show off their movie and bring attention to it, right? So these are very these are all very cool colorish um, using the if we're talking about the color wheel. And so moonlight, that's all cool colors with the kind of blues and purples. And then Blade Runner, what would this be if they kind of got this blue and orange feel to it? So is it like complementary colors? They did it on purpose because they know Blue and orange look good together. Same with this, uh, the dark night. So using that orange of the fire against the kind of darker blue tone, it helps it stand out, creates a lot of contrast. Um, and then here again, you see complementary colors with like the purple and the yellow. And then even here, so you see like the, I forget what the movie here on the far left. Um, so again, thinking about those like diagonal lines and creating those points that create that tension. Um, 
And then again, you see this blue and orange in the background because we know that that looks good together. Um, do the right thing. So this is, you see a lot of primary colors here and then also some green, but um, the overall composition, it's like red, blue, and yellow. And then again, with those uh, dynamic lines with this jaw, uh, with jaws, it creates that tension and your eye automatically kind of focuses in and moves upward. And then um, La La Land, seeing that complementary colors with the purple and yellow happening. And also remembering those other principles with like balance. So if you were to cut this movie poster in the, on the far left in half, that would feel very balanced, symmetrical. Um, same with Jaws. And then even La La Land, if you were to cut that in half, it'd be about, it's like asymmetrical balance and the use of the negative space makes it feel um, whole. Same with Do the Right Thing, if you were to split that in half. Um, even though the elements aren't identical on each side and where they're spaced at, you still see a lot of, um, because of that negative space and move, the elements moving around, it still feels very balanced. Lots of movement. Um, oops. What, how are we on time? Okay. Um, these are just a couple links to like uh, design awards. So if you are interested in looking up um, more things with like graphic design examples, because these trends are always changing too, but the basic foundations of graphic design are rooted in these principles and how they work together. And so I think it's always interesting to maybe go and look at like what, who, like what designers are winning awards right now, um, because that typically starts leading into new design trends. Um, but I'm gonna go ahead and move on so that we can maybe dive into Illustrator a little bit. And so, a design matrix is, I like to spend a whole class period doing this with my students. Um, so we may not get through, we probably won't get through the whole entire thing, um, but it's just a really nice way to start thinking about these principles and elements more. So if you want to, we have a box folder that should be open to everyone. Um, if you wanna to go to this link, let me see if I can copy it. And then I'm gonna put it in the chat. Hopefully that makes it a little bit easier. Um, and then there should be a file in there called design matrix. Um, but yeah, if you want to spend some more time like kind of going through this, I usually spend a whole class period with students and they either kind of fill it in themselves um, in Illustrator or you can find photos that represent them. Um, but then I'm gonna just use this as a way to kind of cover some brief Illustrator tools to get started and then we'll do um, a design thinking exercise here shortly. So is everyone able to get into that folder? At least I think I put sharing to everyone. Okay, perfect. Share screen. Okay. Try to set this up so I can see both. And is everyone able to get that open on their computers? And is there anyone that has never used Illustrator before? Perfect. All right, so I'm just going to do a basic kind of description of the different panels you'll see um, and then maybe like just kind of briefly play around with some of the tools that we'll use. Um, so I always 
usually stick to just the default. Um, so up here at the top, you'll see it says essentials. And so that's what usually, that is what I never change mine from that. Um, but you can see that there are some different customized ones and you can create your own workspace if you want. Um, but I just, essentials, you can still get to anything that you want. So if you have it set up like this, hopefully it looks similar to what I have here. Um, if your toolbar looks like it has a little bit less um, tools, you can change that by going up to window and go to toolbars and just make sure it's set on advanced. And yes, we'll be, we're an illustrator. Um, sometimes I guess by default, it does set up the basic toolbar, um, but I always like to have the advanced one on there just because they're all there if I need them. Okay, Oops. zoomed in a little. All right, so again, over here on your left is your toolbar. And so that's what different tools you'll obviously be using and I'll cover those in a second. And then over here on the right, you'll see different um, windows. And these just allow you to have a little bit more control and customization depending on what you are working on. So you can see that there's like a gradient that you can do. Um, Pathfinder helps you create different shapes. So if you have two shapes that are overlapping, you can unite them together and it creates one shape. Um, how do you get the toolbar? Um, so if you go up to window toolbars, it should show up if you have advanced or basic. If for some reason, maybe it's hiding somewhere. Okay, yeah, thank you, Jessica. Sometimes these um, can come like unlodged from the side, so it might just be kind of maybe floating off a little ways. Okay, and then you can always snap something back into where you want it. Um, properties is probably one of the best panels to always have open because depending on what tool you have selected over here, it's going to change and give you different options sometimes. Um, I don't have anything really happening here, so it's not changing too much. Um, but it'll always like bring up just like what it thinks that you will need to use. Um, layers, so if anyone's familiar with Photoshop at all, um, it works the same way. So having layers on top of um, different objects and you can always double click and rename them. Um, libraries. Um, you can save different things in the cloud. I don't use it too often. Um, swatches will be where your colors are. I don't have any shapes on here, so it's just kind of giving me a bland option. Um, but when we get more into the exercise, hopefully you'll see things that I'm talking about. And then stroke would be your lines. Um, so changing the weight, um, if you want it rounded, dashed. Um, so transparency, so changing the opacity, if you want something to be a little bit more see-through. There's also these nice blending modes that do um, kind of these different cool effects that you can play around with. Um, transform just changes the size. Um, this align tool is really nice. So if you do want to align something perfectly um, together, this is what like horizontally or vertically, you can space things out and distribute them without having to like go in there and try to measure everything yourself. Um, color, so the RGB. And then color guide, so you'll see um, Adobe does a really nice job by just giving you tons of different options um, depending on what you're looking for. And there's all kinds of different libraries down here that you can click on, so like foods. Maybe you wanna look at some ice cream colors. And then it gives you tons of different, so you see those like complementary, split complementary that it tries to kind of help find, find for you, like high contrast. So yeah, I do like that a lot about Adobe programs is they do already kind of do the work for you and finding like a nice color um, scheme to work with. Okay, so for the design matrix. You, for this, I would say, we could probably just use the like shape tools here. So, oops, ah, sorry. I guess some basic movements. So this 
first arrow up here um, is the selection tool, or you can go to it with the V on your keyboard. And that's just your main tool. That's, that's what's gonna allow you to click on things, move things around um, and select things. And then the direct selection tool lets you customize those a little bit more. And I'll show you here in a second. Um, we'll do a pin tool exercise uh, next, which the, um, the pin tool with the direct selection tool you can create anything that your heart desires. Um, so those, having a good control over those two tools are really great. Um, another one we'll be using, so this here is a pen tool or P. Um, and they have added this curvation tool, which just allows you to do curves. So it just depends on how, you're comfortable, how comfortable you are with the pen tool. Um, again, being a little vague here, sorry, we'll do the pen tool exercise here in a couple of minutes. Um, then there is the line segment tool. So that'll create um, lines. And then arc tool would be like creating some curved lines. You can do the spiral tool, polar grid tool, rectangle grid tool. So all kinds of different things here. Um, the shape tools, primarily for the design thinking exercise, we're gonna be thinking about visualizing words by just using lines and points. Um, so that's kind of the challenge with it. And so usually you can just use like the rectangle tool or the ellipse tool if you aren't wanting to use the pin tool. Um, so that's always these two, which is like M for rectangle, L for ellipse. Um, the brush tool, so just like a paintbrush, if you remember Microsoft Paint at all. Um, what else will we use? That's probably gonna be about all we, use today. Um, but I definitely encourage you to kind of play around with all of these um, different tools. And then if you do, so if I have the rectangle tool, I'm just going to draw a rectangle real quick. Um, and you can see that it's white with a black stroke. And that is because down here, this top one is the fill. Whereas this one where it's kind of cut out there um, in the middle is the stroke. And if you want to swap those, I can hit this little arrow. And so now it's a black square with a white stroke. And if you want to change that at all, you just double click it and it'll bring up this color picker and you can change that color, hit okay. You can do the same with the fill. Maybe I'll do some complementary colors. So hopefully like that's about as in depth as we'll probably go with like changing the color and making shapes for this um, design exercise. Okay, so then just to kind of maybe start a couple blocks on this design matrix and how it works. So essentially you're just thinking about those principles and those elements. So how could you create balance by using just lines? Um, so for that, if you wanted to just use the line tool um, and then I'll probably get rid of the fill since I don't need one if I'm just using fill or just using stroke, I'm sorry. I'll hit this um, none down here. And so that's gonna take away that yellow color. And so now I just have, I'm working with just a purple line. And so um, I'm gonna zoom in, which is the little magnifying glass. Or if you hit Z on your keyboard, it automatically will be a plus sign. And then I'm just gonna click in and zoom in because my eyes are terrible from looking at screens all the time. <laughs> um, okay, so then line tool, creating balance. And you can get as creative as you want with this or just make it super simple. So maybe just for balance, you want to click and draw a line down. And if you hold shift, it's gonna lock that into those 45 degrees around. So I'm just gonna hold shift and drag down. And now it's like a um, symmetrical balance. Or maybe you even wanted to copy these. And so a good shortcut for that to clone something, if you hold your Alt key while um, an object is selected and you hover over it, if you see my keyboard, um, it kind of pops up with like this little clone next to it, a little clone cursor. If you hold Alt and then click and drag, and then I'm also gonna hold Shift yeah, just so that it stays in line together and then release my mouse and then I'll release those other buttons. And that's just a really easy way to clone something and a shape instead of having to constantly always try to rebuild it and make sure it's the same size or something. And then 
you can continue doing that where you just drag it over. But another little shortcut key that I always like is once you copy something like that, if you hit control D, it'll continue that infinitely until you do something else. So I just hit control D and that repeated that same line. And so now we have a little bit of like asymmetrical balance going on with just those lines. How did you get to the colors? Um, so you can just double click if you have your color area here. And so this, the main square is the fill. And if you double click into it, that'll change it. Um, but since I'm just working with the line tool, all I change is the stroke, which I double click into there and then you can select your color. And then maybe for movement, um, maybe I want to switch to the paintbrush tool. And then it's a little bit big. Where's like my brush? Brushes. Oh, I guess I did forget to mention. Um, these panels here on the right are always um, customizable. So in the window panel, you'll see tons more uh, other windows that you can open up to. So like there's type where you'll see like your character, same sort of tools that you'll see like working with Word or Google Docs. Um, so there's tons of different things. And so I'm just gonna work with a brush real quick. So I'm gonna open up the brushes panel. And that didn't give me much. I'm just gonna try to change the size. Okay, it's okay. So to create line and movement, I think, you know, movement can kind of be like a curved. And what is nice about this is it does, oh, I'm clicking the wrong stuff. It does automatically kind of smooth things out for you. Like if I was to draw this with um, my mouse, you can see that it kind of helps try to make it a little bit nicer of a line. And then there's also um, the pencil tool, or if you want to play around with the arc tool, which that's just, that's going to create your lines, some curved lines. Maybe create some movement like that. And if you ever want to rotate or change a shape, you would just click on it with that direct selection tool. And then if you hover over it um, around like the sides, you should see like a little curved arrow pull up and then you can rotate it and move it around like so. So I might just kind of move these little lines. And if you want to make them thicker, if you just you have it selected and go to that stroke window that I mentioned earlier. And right now my weight is like 0.5 and I can up that however much I want. All right, so I'm just gonna kind of maybe pick around on what sort of um, combinations and squares I wanna do. Um, and does anybody have any questions so far, like any specific tool to show them. How do you repeat? Paintbrush is not working. Okay, so repeating, um, if it's like a shape that you're wanting to repeat, Paintful works. Okay, give me a second. Let me show how to repeat real quick and then I'll see if I can help with that. Okay, so I just like to do, you can always control C, control V to copy paste. Um, the shortcut I like to use is if I have a shape selected, I hold alt and I get this little clone cursor and then I can drag that over. And you can just clone that as many times as you want if you hold the alt key. Um, and then if you do do that once and you want to repeat that, it's the control D. 
So if I did that once, now as long as it's still selected, I can hit Control D and then it's just gonna go forever until I change what movement I did. And then paintbrush. Hmm. I've had that happen before and I'm trying to think what I did to fix it. Jolisa or Alexia, do you know? Okay. Okay, well, I'm sorry you're having issues with the paintbrush tool. Yeah, make sure there's, um, yeah, a stroke or a fill in there. Or I'm not sure what else it could be. Yeah, sometimes these tools just, if something isn't, I don't know why I don't have that many options in here. Okay. The pen tool is more fun anyways than the brush tool. <laughs> I like the pen tool. Um, okay, so then maybe with shape, create some balance by I have like a large shape here. And then maybe I want to make it small. So trying to remember my principles and creating that balance, whether it's asymmetrical or symmetrical or radial. Um, let's see. Texture. Face, which one? Maybe do a shape pattern. And make it purple. And then I'm going to take a stroke here. Does anyone want to show maybe some of the ones that they've done? I can probably, I think I can share the screen. Um, line tool. Is it hidden behind something? Um, do you see either the arc tool spiral grid or polar grid? Because it might just be that you have to click and hold. Oops. If you click and hold, there's usually tools hidden below. Um, or if you have the basic toolbar, You may not see it with the basic toolbar, um, but if you do window, oh, my Zoom stuff is in my way. Window toolbars advanced, it should pop up next to the type tool. So with the paintbrush, let me see. My zoom, I need to pull that down. I know if you go, if you have it on a stroke, and I just changed my window. Let me go back to the Essentials workspace. I was able to make it smaller by, oops. Um, so if you see, if you saw that, I have my fill 
the color is now on the fill and so you can tell that like stroke isn't active but when I hit this arrow and switch that fill to the stroke now I can alter this um, stroke panel and so you can change the weight of it here if you want it smaller thicker And then there's also, if you open up the windows for the brushes here, or F5, um, there are some like Adobe customized ones that you can try to play around with. These look like lines. So bristle brush, you can kind of change that, the way that it looks. And there's also different sizes here as well. Um, we might spend just like three more minutes trying to fill this in and just kind of have fun thinking about those different um, elements and um, principles. And then we're going to do a little bit of a pen tool exercise just so that um, we'll spend like the last 30 minutes or so doing that design thinking and trying to visualize something without being able to type it out. If, hopefully that makes sense. So using these elements and principles to convey a message without words is essentially what we'll be doing for the main um, exercise. Um, so color. So do you, did you use like the rectangle tool? Like if you drew a square, oops, I have no color. Um, so it's here under the type tool, or you can hit M on your keyboard. So these little letters that are in parentheses are shortcuts, and you can customize those too. Um, I've never done that, but some people do. But this little box rectangle, and then if you just click and drag, if you hold shift, it's going to create a perfect square. Yeah. And then same with that ellipse tool. So you can make ovals. If you hold shift, that's going to create a perfect circle. And then um, to fill that in, if you do have that outline color and it's, you want to fill, if you want to swap that stroke to a fill, you just can click this little arrow here. Or you can also do shift X is the keyboard shortcut. So if I hit shift X, I can switch back and forth between an outline and a stroke pretty easily. Um, let's see, value. If you want to play around with the gradient tool, um, I don't want to like throw too much at everyone all at once. Um, but I'm going to swap this to a fill. And then this little button down here. So you can see that this is color, gradient, or none. And so this middle one, if you hit the gradient, you'll see that it automatically pops open this other uh, window panel. And then you can customize this gradient. So if I click on this white dot here. Oh, something's wrong with my colors. I don't have any color swatches. Hang on, sorry. might be the file that we're working with if it's being weird now that I'm thinking about it. Hmm. 
Okay, sorry, the gradient's not working. It must have been, because this was a PDF file that I dragged into Illustrator and I'm thinking maybe it's doing this weird black and white thing with color. Okay, hopefully our other files won't do that. Okay, so I encourage anyone to just, if you are interested in these principles and elements, keep building and playing with this design matrix. I'm gonna go ahead and move on so that, all right, well, thank you for joining us, Eleanor. Um, okay. All right, so then, sorry, I need to transition my brain. Let me go back to, okay, so the pen tool. So in that same folder that we went to previously, I'll copy that link again in there if you closed out of it. Um, but then open that up. I'm gonna go and close out the design matrix. And it should look something like this. And if you've gone to one of our previous Illustrator um, tutorials, we use this a lot because it's just, it's one of the best ways to learn is uh, with the pen tool is simply by tracing because a lot of times how people go through the process of their design is they sketch everything out and then they'll import it into their computer and then they'll trace around their sketches. Um, so that's usually the process of going through different designs. Um, some people can start just totally from scratch and start drawing. I personally am not great at doing that. Um, I like to work from like images or sketches or something and then I just build those vectors on top of them. So is everyone able to open this one up? Okay. And then um, I'm only gonna tr really cover maybe these first like five because I think that's really all we'll need to do this final kind of exercise together. Um, but again, like these, that file, that folder will always be there if you wanna go back in and practice a little bit more, that's always available. Okay, so the pen tool is probably the most powerful tool in Illustrator. Um, it is my favorite. It is the one that people hate the most when they are learning Illustrator because it is just, it's a little hard to grasp at first, but once you just constantly use it, like anything else, it just, it gets better over time. Um, I'd hope, I guess, Jaleesa and Alexia have been my students before. I think they can attest to hating it at first and then I think they like it now. I love the pen tool, <laughs> personally. Yes. So I remember when I was learning it, I hated it. I hated it so much, but then now it's my go-to tool for everything. <laughs> okay. So hopefully we're here right now and you can kind of see at the top, there's different anchor point behavior signs. Um, so I really like the pen tool because if you remember the elements that we were talking about, everything starts with a point. So everything that you make with the pen tool is a point. And then it's an extension of it, which creates a line. And then if you go all the way around to connect it to your original point, you create a shape. Um, so this is what the star here will be, just straight lines. Um, so all you do is click and release. So you can kind of follow this little template all the way around um, and create straight lines. So if you click to start a new path, you'll see this, it's like a little star start a new path. Um, once you do come all the way around, you'll see a little circle pop up, which means you're closing the path to like enclose the whole shape. Um, we'll talk about these corner and ads too a little bit later. Um, okay, so I'm just going to click once there in that circle and you can see that people kind of call it like a little rubber band. Um, so I made that anchor point and then this extension of this blue line here is that line that I'm going to make next. And so I'm going to click at the two. So now I have a line. You can see that it's um, a black stroke because of my color palette there to the left. And I'm going to click again on the three, click and release, and then click again, click again. I'm just going to follow all the way around just clicking. And then it kind of, you can see that it hid a little bit and that's because we have a fill there. And so that's another thing that I always like to, when I'm tracing something, especially, 
I always just like to work with a stroke. And so since I can't see where that point is, I'm gonna go over here to the side and just hit that none. And so now all I have is that stroke and I can still continue my line here. And then hover over that, I get that little circle and then it closes that shape. And so now this is, you can change that to a fill again, keep it at a stroke, but you've made a shape now. Okay, and then curve lines, this is where it gets a little trickier. Um, so that's when you, so remember just clicking once, that's straight lines. So now if you click and drag, that creates a curved line. So click here, or click and press here, hold down shift key. So I'm gonna click, hold down shift, and shift is just maintaining that um, perfect circle proportion. That's all it's doing. Like again, it's like, it likes that 45 degree angle. Um, so then I'm gonna click and drag and you get these little handlebars. If you can see that I have like those two points on the end, it's a little different than when earlier when I just clicked and was had that um, line. So these handlebars are determining the angle of your curve, how like deep it is, how sharp it may be, or um, shallow. So um, I'm gonna click and release here with those anchor, um, those handles. And then now is like kind of where before when you just clicked once, um, you have that like rubber band line that you can kind of move or whatever. But you can see that it's trying to follow this curve now. And so the same thing here, I'm gonna click and hold shift and drag those handles. Um, and then you can see if you change that direction, it changes that curve that you've just made. But I'm gonna drag it to the four and release. And so now I've made that line. And I'm gonna do the same here. Click here, hold shift and drag and release. And then I'm gonna continue it again, hold shift and just drag again to that two. It doesn't really give you that final step, but just drag again to that two and then you've created a circle. Again, if you do want a perfect circle, you'd probably just use the ellipse tool, but this is just, um, a good step of learning how to create those shapes with the curved lines. Is everyone okay so far? Do I need to repeat anything? It is easier with the mouse. Um, if you are working on a laptop, yeah, it is a little tricky. Um, let me see, because I'm on a laptop. Do you have like buttons on your laptop at least to like do the left and right? Yeah, I do. Okay, um, yeah, so you would just click, you'd have to click with like the left button and then, yeah, it's just a little bit harder. And then again, if you like, you would hold on that left button and drag to make those handles and then drag again. Yeah, I guess we should put like a disclaimer a little bit. Sorry, I always forget about that. Because it is a little bit harder with the trackpad because then your hands start to cramp up. <laughs> um, but yeah, I always like to have one of those just easy Bluetooth um, mouse put in. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and skip ahead to the multiple curves. Okay, so then here, clicking, um, click and press here and hold down shift. So you're not releasing it. So again, we're making curved lines. So we're clicking and dragging. So I'm gonna click, hold, then press shift and drag up. And the reason why I'm dragging up, because I know you see this other like opposite handle here. That's because you want to drag in the direction your line will be going. Because if I was to drag down, my line is now going to go this way. 
I'm gonna hit control Z. So now I wanna drag up because I want my line to come out from this direction. And then I'll do the same thing here, click and drag down. Click and drag up with the handle. And then click and drag down. And then earlier I mentioned um, that direct selection tool. So if your lines aren't quite perfect and you're not happy with the way your curve looks, you can always customize it. And so sometimes I'll just, if, I, if I'm tracing something and I see a point that I like hate, I know that I like will need to fix it. Instead of just like control Z and deleting everything and starting over, there's, it's super easy to fix it. If you just wanna continue your shape and then go back to it later. Um, so I'm gonna hit V just to, like I'm done tracing my line here. So now my line is complete here. And then I'm gonna switch over to that direct selection tool or A on your keyboard. And this, let me zoom in a little. This allows you to manipulate any point that you have made. So if I click on this point, you can see that those um, handlebars come up. And now I can change that curve however I would like to. And you can drag them inward, oops, drag them in. You can drag them up to where they're, uh, makes a more dramatic of a curve. Um, so that's always something, something nice to work with. It's like, don't ever think that like, you need to just start completely over because you can always go back in, go ahead and finish that shape out and then go back in with this um, direct selection tool to just kind of customize it the way that you need. Okay. Curves with corner points, it gets a little bit trickier. Okay, pin tool, zoom in. Okay, so click and press here, hold down shift. So again, I'm making a curved line. So, and I'm dragging it downward because I want my line to come out from that side. And then there's the line that I'm making. So since I don't want it to be a curved line, remember if you just click once, it's a straight line. So then I'm gonna click and release. And so now I have a straight line. Um, that's not what we want next. So to change that, to make it still be a curved, curve line you can press directly on the anchor point that you just created and so if you remember uh, up here sorry there's this corner point sign so if you already have a point there you can customize it into being curved or straight um depending on which way you want it let me go find this again okay so if i hover over it so right now it's the straight lines and so i'm going to click and hold and drag down and now I've created the curved line I've changed that anchor point to now be curved and then same thing click and release and since I don't want the straight line I can hover back over it to change that corner um, to be a curved line and then drag and release and then if you see what I just did there, I'm holding spacebar and it just allows me to kind of pan around my page instead of having to always like zoom in, zoom out and lose my tool. And then that's done. Are we still doing okay? And the pin tool takes lots of practice. So if it's a little frustrating, don't give up. Don't think that you can't do it because it's just, it's a tool that takes time to learn and get used to um, how it works. And the more you practice, the better you get at it. Okay, so then this is similar to what we just did, um, except you're gonna have the path coming from the top of it and it's like a repeated half circle. I'm gonna go back to the pin tool, click, press, oops. I didn't click and drag. So I'm gonna press and then drag upward and then click and press and drag to here and then release. And so since remember earlier, we did the, the same sort of uh, movement where we continue the line downward. And so now we need to change that direction of this handle. 
And so you hold down Alt or Option, depending if you're on a Mac or PC. And it now changes my entire cursor to a curve, um, the curve customization option. Versus like if you were to hover over it, it's kind of a miniature little um, triangle. So I'm gonna hold Shift, or sorry, hold Alt Option. And then you wanna drag that handle and move it upwards. So now you've changed that direction of that line where now it's coming back out, the, out of the top of the point. And then I'm gonna click and press and drag down again to match that curve. And then again, hold Alt Option and go upward. And we're just gonna repeat that again. Yeah. Okay, and then this will be like the last one we do real quick and then we'll get started with the exercise, um, the main one. Okay, so then combining curved lines with straight lines. So you're going to click and press to hold down shift just to create that perfect circle ratio and then click and hold shift again, drag there, and then back on five. So remember we're changing the direction. We want this now to be a straight line, but since we clicked and dragged, it's a curved line. And so what you just do is you just click back on that same anchor point and it takes away that curve for that next line. And then since you want that to be a straight line, you'll just click and release. But then now we just, we have straight line again. So we need to press down on that anchor point again and hold shift just to keep those proportions and drag that handle to make that curve back down to seven. And then you'll just repeat it from the other direction where with eight, you'll click and hold, drag the handle up to nine and release. But since we don't want this curve here now, we just go back to the anchor point and click. And then now we have the, we got rid of that curved handle. And then we'll click again. And since now we want curved, we'll hover back over, click and drag that handle to make that curve. And then now we'll be able to do that, that curved line coming out. How's everyone doing? making a little sense at least that you feel you can make some shapes with it, some curved ones or straight lines. Um, if you are having a hard time with the pin tool, like don't worry about it because this next ex exercise, if you'd rather just stick to using like the ellipse tool and the rectangle tool, um, that's totally fine. Because essentially the next um, exercise, I'll just go ahead and explain it. Let me go back to my PowerPoint. Oh yeah, this is what we were going to do. Okay, so if you want to go ahead and go up to file and go to new and then you can just do like the regular letter form um, eight and a half by 11 inches and hit create 
Okay, and then this is just something I like to do um, just to get people to start thinking about how just simple lines can express meaning. Um, so if you have a blank page out in front of you, you'd want to do the brush tool or the pencil tool um, or whichever you would like to use. I'm going to probably just do, I might do the pencil tool, which is underneath this shaper tool. And it just allows like free form like a pencil. Okay, so let me go back to my slideshow. Okay, so draw a happy line. Like what to you, if you see a line, represents the feeling of happiness. Because for me, it might be something like a little like whimsical, kind of curvy, it's having fun, it's a happy line. Maybe not so dramatic off to the side, but that's fine. Okay, let me go back to my pencil tool. How about an angry line? You know, maybe that's something like sharper points, kind of like, ah, maybe that's like an angry line. How about calm? So if you had to express calmness with just the line, what might that look like? Maybe just kind of like, that's a little subtle curve to it. All right. Um, anxious? Hmm. Maybe kind of like a little scribble. Maybe something like that. Sad. What's a sad line look like? Maybe just like a little frame. Excited? Ah. <laughs> Sorry, I'm making sound effects as I do this. <laughs> It helps, I promise. Make sound effects. <laughs> um, guilty. What does like a guilty line look like? Hmm. You just, I don't know. I feel like it's small. It's kind of, I get the, the idea of like small or trying to like kind of hide. Um, surprised. Ah, I don't know. <laughs> But um, basically, I like doing this exercise just because it kind of gets you thinking about how to express emotions or feelings through a very simple um, element, which leads us into this next part, which is, let me go, slideshow, okay. So communicating without words which is a huge part about graphic design, right? So like maybe you can't use any type at all and you still want to communicate meaning. Um, so what we'll do is using only lines and points, create compositions that convey the, convey the following opposites. So congestion, isolation. Um, so maybe if someone has an example, what do you think how do you think you could arrange something to convey congestion? Any ideas? You know, if you think of congestion, I think of like heavy traffic or something. And so maybe cramming, giving that feeling of just like, tightness and cramming something all into something kind of gives that feeling of congestion whereas isolation would be the opposite and sorry if you hear noises in the background my dog is chewing on a bone and being loud um okay and then instability versus stability so what sort of how could you arrange just using lines and points um a composition that conveys instability, you know, so maybe something that's like, seems like it's teetering off the edge. Um, 
where stability was some, would feel like something that's very solidly structured. Tension versus playful. So again, tension, probably a lot of diagonal lines and um, you know points that are near each other and creating that sense of um, tension or like fear like that we saw on some of those movie posters versus playful, probably a lot of like curved lines and fun and um, some bright colors. Chaotic versus organized. So maybe stuff just seems totally out of place and just going everywhere versus something like organized, which probably looked like a pattern or something. Um, rigid versus fluid. So again, rigid seeing like hard edges hard and bold um, shapes versus fluid, you think more like water or liquid. So it's like curved lines. Um, so those are just kind of ideas of what I at least am thinking about um, for this exercise. And so I did want to see some examples if you're not really sure how to get started with this. Um, so these are previous student work. Um, so just using lines and dots. So this top left one would be organized. You can see or oh, wait, sorry, because this is instability. So you can kind of see that having these um, balls kind of are balancing and like teetering on edge, it kind of gives you that feeling that it's like about to topple over versus this is very um, kind of, there's organic shapes there, but it's still very um, balanced symmetrically and organized and stable or something like this, where this is kind of like the idea of congestion. So all of those things are kind of crammed. They feel crammed like they can't really get out of that space. Whereas um, here with this, um, now they're kind of free flowing and coming out of there. Um, I think this is rigid and fluid. So again, kind of seeing those like curved lines more so represents the idea of um, the fluid and rigid having these sharp pointy lines where um, it almost seems like those are like little bubbles that are going to pop against those spikes. Um, here's some more, a couple more examples. So I'm trying to remember what the words were. I think this was I think this is un or instability. So again, it's kind of that teetering, kind of just the way you angle shapes and put them right on the edge of each other. It creates that tension feeling where it's about to like topple over. I think this was um, stability. So everything is well balanced and um, stable. I'd probably make those lines a little thicker because it does kind of seem like it could fall um, or break. And then this was organized. So even though it is kind of, um, there's a lot going on, it's still like a pattern that's happening, um, divisions here, whereas this is kind of more chaotic. It's kind of like a burst or an explosion happening. Um, I think this was the isolation one. So having these kind of groups together um, and kind of having them separate apart. So you, with that, principle of proximity, you can see this is like all together as a group versus these are kind of like off on their own a little bit and not away from the group. And then I think this was playful. Sorry, it's been a couple years. Um, but yeah, and then a couple other examples. So here's another example of like isolation. So you know, you have this whole group over here to the right and then you just have this one floating off to the other side um i think this was chaotic kind of bringing me back to that um you know drawing a line of what anxious or something looks like um here is that instability so those kind of getting off balance and falling off to the side and then they made an actual chain to represent stability um, I think this was ten tension. So like kind of they use the pen tool to create almost like two ropes that are about to break. So again, using those like pointed dynamic shapes um, 
to give that to convey that meaning and that feeling to your viewer and then i think it's playful so you know using those different like more rounded shapes and fun colors and kind of creating this little playful environment um i think this was chaotic so the spirals um, using some of those um, primary colors and complementary colors and then this was organized so kind of dividing things up to look organized i can't remember what that one was but um yeah so if you go back into that folder oops there is let me exit out of this stuff okay if you go back to that um participant folder you'll see the graphic design gd basics and then it'll open up to something like this okay good our swatches are there and i've labeled and like locked those types um words down So does anyone have any ideas or of how to maybe convey congestion? Because then, so like you can use the pen tool, like we just kind of briefly went over to draw something, or if you just are more comfortable with using the ellipse tool um, and the rectangle tool. So really just trying to use um, points and lines and you can use shapes because shapes are essentially points and lines. So that's kind of a way to interpret that. If you want to do like a customized shape. Um, let me see. I'm trying to think of how maybe I want to do isolation first. Um, does anyone have any questions so far? Does this like make sense? Um, in terms of like using these elements to convey a message. Trying to break this down into like bare minimum of design and communicating ideas. Okay, I'm going to just draw a square. So that's my background. And then maybe I just want like a long little circle. I don't know. Okay, congestion. Maybe I want to make lots of circles. Um, and also, if you notice, these are different artboards. Um, so if you do have something overlap on the edge, once you do like export it out, you won't see anything that's falling off of it. Um, Cause I know a lot of times people just, they want to like have their elements hug the edge there. Um, but again, as we've talked about, it kind of creates this tension that you may or may not want. If that is the feeling that you want, then by all means do that. Um, but sometimes it is just nice to like take it over the edge a little bit and then it gets rid of that um, feeling for your user or your viewer sorry okay and then i'm gonna actually maybe put white outline around it and then i'm holding alt or option if you're on a mac and i'm just cloning these to make a bunch of circles And all I'm doing is holding alt and clicking and dragging. And 
And then if you do want to see what this looks like um, without, because like right now I can't really get an idea of what my composition looks like since I don't have that hard edge there. Um, Illustrator has added this nice tool that if you go up to view, go to trim view, and it's going to take away anything that's in that gray area that's just kind of off your artboard. And so now I see this nice hard edge and I can decide if like I like the placement of some of these and kind of move them around. Um, another good tool to use is my group chat. Where is it? Oh, okay. So let's say I want this circle. I don't like that it's hiding behind these other two shapes. And so I'm going to bring that forward. Um, so if I have that selected, if you go up to object and arrange, and if you've made stuff in PowerPoint or a similar program, they have these tools as well. So it works the same way. So I can bring to front or I can bring forward, which is just going to bring it one step forward. Um, but if I know I want it on top, just bring to front and that's going to bring it to where it's on top of those shapes versus behind it. Um, and then I'm just going to keep kind of dragging things. And if I see ones that are already like hidden behind shapes, I can just hold alt and drag them and they're going to stay kind of in that same, they're going to stay behind the other shapes that I um, had placed on top of it. But yeah. And then I might actually just kind of grab all of these just to make it a little bit quicker. And drag that over. Um, and then one thing you'll notice here when I drag that over, you'll see that if it does overlap on another artboard, it will show up there. Um, so I'm just going to go ahead and delete that shape because it wasn't really showing up on my artboard over here anyways. So yeah, maybe this is gives the viewer a little feeling of congestion happening. Might create a little bit more. Where it starts to kind of trying to give that feeling that it's like consuming that composition space is kind of what I'm going for here. Okay, let me, I'm going to get out of trim view just so I can see what my words are. And then instability and stability. So again, something that's kind of like teetering off. So maybe I want to create like a seesaw almost. I'm just going to create, use the pen tool and create like a triangle shape. And then maybe I'll have like a little ball here. Sorry, I'm zooming in a lot. Oh. rested there on the edge and then maybe I'll create a bigger one See, and like I'm trying to like have my shapes right on the edge, just barely touching each other to kind of create that feeling that it's like falling over or something, you know, creating that tension, which I probably still play around with this a little bit. I'm not sure I like that, the way that this is arranged. And then stability, I mean, this could be something, I don't know, maybe you think of like a table. 
tables are pretty stable. And you just want to do a very simple representation. Um, so we are kind of nearing the end of time. I'm sorry we didn't make it all the way through um, working with these, but hopefully this was fun and you learned a lot from it with, um, you know, using these very simple elements to communicate ideas. Um, does anyone maybe want to show, like I can share their screen um, and show like what they have so far? Let me see if I can... Do I have to stop screen share? Thank you, Bernadette. Um, I'm gonna stop share, or let me, I have one more slide. And then if anyone, for the last couple minutes, if anyone wants to um, show off what they've created so far, I would love to see it. Um, and if you do continue through this, um, please like save it and send it to our email because we'd like to see what everyone is creating and making from this. Um, so just real quickly, like things to remember. So these elements and principles are applied in every design. Um, they can help determine what you want to communicate to your audience. And then this all applies to the typeface you use, the colors, level of detail, etc. cetera. Um, but keep like, but with that in mind, don't be afraid to break the rules. So these are just those foundations and, um, you know, you need to understand the foundations in order to kind of break them and do what you want with it. So, um, and that's what makes like design so much fun. And I hope that now when you go out and like see advertisements, um, poster design, movie posters, all of that, book covers that, you know, maybe you can kind of point out those different principles that have been used to catch your eye. You know, think about why did I get drawn to this in the first place? Um, so that's kind of the point of what we were hoping to get from this. Um, so yeah, I'm going to stop my screen share. If someone wants to share theirs, I think I can allow. Yeah, so one participant can share. I think anyone who can share, all participants. Yeah, so if you want to, don't feel pressured to. Um, but if anyone wants to share their screen, it's open. And then Thank you all so much for joining us. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to ask them now. Um, you can also send us an email or something. Um, and we have been recording this. So again, this will be posted if you wanna revisit it. And what else? Um, tomorrow or Monday, you will be getting a link for a online evaluation. And we do like to hear your thoughts, what you learned from it. Um, also give us ideas of what you would like to learn um, in the future. So we'll be doing, um, we have started doing like micro tutorials and adding them to the CWITS uh, YouTube page. And so we've covered like, they're basically like five to 10 minute quick tutorials on like Photoshop, Adobe Spark, Illustrator. Um, so we're happy to put something together if there's something that anyone wants to look at. Um, but yeah, if anyone has anything to share at all, hopefully this was helpful to get you started with, you know, making awesome design.